Okay, okay. just... Okay, go on. Oh, before you do that, before you do that, do you like it? Okay, there you are. There you are. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. As Abby is dying next to me because I'm learning. <laughs> we were having problems with my camera. So, we're going to try this again. Probably, uh, for all I know, all of that captured. I don't know. No, they okay. don't have any of that. You get to start from the beginning, boo-boo. Beginning's good. Beginning's good. <laughs> I tried this, like, because I was so distracted by that camera being a problem. Oh, no. That's... I'm sorry. Don't... We're going to kill no. Abby. Yay! Thank you guys for bearing with me. I've been doing this for 15 minutes, and I forgot to press a button, and because we've been dealing with camera issues. So, hi, everybody! Thank you for bearing with me. Abby's going to go... <laughs> if I didn't have a stain off my shirt and had underpants on, I would say something, but I don't. I'm wearing my jammies. <laughs> okay. Right around the block like an idiot. Thank okay. you. I'll see you later. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. And 15,000 thanks to Abby. I'm going to have to, like, bake her a cake or something. I just... This is a day. I'm learning. Bear with me, this is my very first time doing this and I have messed everything up and I was supposed to be on a fancy camera and everything, so. Okay, guys, let's do this now that I'm much more focused and making a mess of things. Um, so, I know you guys had tons of questions about shoes, but most of them seem to boil down to a few really repetitive ones. So we're gonna start by me sort of giving you my background of where in the world I learned this, how did I learn this, how can you learn this, like, all of that stuff. So my first shoe, and I, I mean, there's a pair of them. I'm just pulling the one out, but this is my very first shoe. And I learned how to do this in a workshop. Um, so I was fortunate enough that I lived in Williamsburg and I worked at Colonial Williamsburg back in 2000, sorry, 2011, 2012. During those years, I took a workshop from Brett Walker, who is, or at that time, was working at the shoemaker shop in Colonial Williamsburg, and they focus mostly on men's shoes, but he also knew enough about women's shoes to teach workshops on it. So I was very fortunate in the fact that I managed, um, <laughs> pants are the devil, yes they are, um, <laughs> I managed to learn through a workshop. It was done weekend over weekend over weekend. Um, and we sort of had homework in between, and it turns out I was the only person that actually did their homework. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, and I managed to be the crazy person that not only did all of their homework, but really loved it to the point where I was like, can I keep learning? Can I keep training? So I continued training under Brett up until 2015 when I moved. Um, and by that point I had been making shoes for other people and I had made a few dozen pairs of shoes and learned lots of different techniques and was kind of like pushing out into the wild wonders of figuring this all out on my own. So this pair of shoes has a great story. And the fact that, like I said, I made this in this workshop. Um, it took me about six to nine months to make this first pair of shoes. Um, they are pretty terrible in terms of construction in comparison to my abilities now but they also don't fit. Like, I can't actually wear them. Um, they're way too big. So you can sort of compare that to this. <laughs> this is a shoe that actually fits me. This is a shoe that doesn't. Um, and turns out what it was, was we were learning how to do measurements in the class. And the person taking my measurements was kind of nervous about making the shoes too small and took my measurements too loose. And so the difference of just a few centimeters um, means that this is like a D width and I'm like a double triple A. So <laughs> it, doesn't, it falls off my foot. Um, so yeah, I fortunately learned a lot on these and kind of did the whole fall off the horse, get right back on thing again. Um, and ended up making many, many more shoes, which you can kind of see behind me. Um, the camera was set up higher originally, so <laughs> you could see a lot more. But yeah, my very first pair of shoes, I wore them once, um, and that was 
it. And I, other people have worn them over the years. I've lent them to people. Um, the second pair of shoes is far more dead because another question that you guys had was how do these actually wear? Um, how long do they last? And this is a great example of a very dead shoe. <laughs> it could be revitalized. It could be brought back to life if I really wanted to. Um, but it's got some issues in terms of the construction. It's the buckles worn it out. The actual sole has some holes in it, which is more my fault than the shoes, um, just because you can see my stitches and I put my stitches too deep. Um, so they wore through too fast, but there are ways you can do that, like fix that. You can clump sole it, which is this other very dead shoe. And so you essentially stitch on another sole and you can continue to make the shoe live for a really long time doing that. And I get miles out of these shoes. When I was measuring like the wear on them, I measured by the mile. Um, I did walking programs at Colonial Williamsburg. So it, it literally took miles and miles and miles and years to wear them all out. Um, so that was like the impressive thing. The more, I don't know, impressive pair of shoes mileage wise is this pair. This is my pair of common shoes. I think it was the fourth pair I ever made and they are sturdy and durable. And I have replaced the heel cap and put a extra sole on multiple times um, and just finally reached the point where I was like, I, I don't want to do it anymore. Like uppers are still good. That's the crazy thing. Um, I could just replace the sole and the heel on this again and it'd still be good for another few hundred miles. So it's good to go. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> like you get a lot of wear and tear out of them. Um, but that's sort of where my background is, was I was able to actually train under somebody that knew the basics of shoemaking, well, knew far more than the basics. He knew a lot about men's shoemaking and he knew some about women's shoemaking. And then I was able to just keep working on it from there. Um, I went and looked at originals in museums, a lot of them. Um, I've been up and down the East Coast a few times, went up to the Bata Shoe Museum, was fortunate enough to meet Mrs. Bata. She was incredibly lovely, crazy, wonderful woman um, who has since passed away, and I'm so grateful I got to actually meet her. But they have such an amazing collection, and so I got to spend time there, and in, of course, Williamsburg, and all sorts of other museums up and down the East Coast. Um, the New England Historic Society is like gold when it comes to shoes. Um, and so I, I was fortunate enough for that. And then I've just kept teaching myself and learning new things, um, learning new techniques, like how do I deal with 19th century techniques like cementing rather than stitching? Um, how do I deal with 20th century lasts and cardboard shanks and all sorts of crazy stuff? So I've since learned a lot of that. Um, in terms of learning yourself in modern day, since people are not gonna be in that situation where they just have a workshop nearby. I know that. Um, I have taken a few modern classes online for like modern shoemaking. And I highly recommend if you look up Marcel Marsan, the last name is M-R-S-A-N. He has some digital classes that you can pay and you get access to it for a certain amount of time. And women's shoemaking, modern women's shoemaking and men's shoemaking. They're very similar to historic. The difference is that you won't find classes on how to make women's 18th century shoes, like turn shoes, how to put those heels in by hand and stitched in. <clears throat> but you can learn either how to pattern and cut and fit and the basic parts of a shoe for women's shoemaking. And even though it's cementing together, it's the same basic parts. Um, it's just different techniques of assembling them. but it's all very similar and it's a really good basis for understanding how to pattern them and how to fit your feet. Or you can do men's modern shoemaking courses where you get to learn how to do the stitching. It's a slightly different stitching techniques, but you'll learn how to use the awl. You'll learn how to use the knife. You'll learn how to use all of those things. So it's incredibly useful. Um, in that regard. So those are two different ways that you can learn modern things. And I know there are classes, digital classes or books that you can get from shoemaking websites or things like that. So that's where I really recommend that you start if this is something you want to get into. Um, it is a very intensive thing. Um, I pulled on a lot of knowledge from sewing, say for the fabric uppers, um, of clay and sculpting for making the lasts, of wood carving, so much wood because the heels and the lasts, and I never thought I would spend that much time carving wood again, 
Um, it was like a hobby when I was a kid. And just everything that I know in terms of art or any craft-based things, um, I've ended up using those. So there's not really one single thing to learn about. Obviously, medical knowledge of feet. I was fortunate enough, again, to learn that from somebody that had learned that from somebody. And so I have a basic understanding of that. Um, and went from there. So the hard part, though, is the tools. You can get modern versions of these really super easy. Um, but this is my toolbox. My very heavy, massive, lots of things in a toolbox. Um, and you don't need this much. You don't need a fancy toolbox. You don't need historic tools. Um, I did a lot of events where I was in costume presenting 18th century things, so kind of needed them. But what you really need is a shoemaker's knife. Um, there are different shapes and styles. I really like this. This is a modern one that you can get pretty easily um, in terms of the blade shape. You can't necessarily get it with the wooden handle, but you can get this blade shape. Um, I think even Tandy Leather sells it. Um, so, and Tandy Leather also sells some leathers that are appropriate for shoemaking. They even sell shoe, like, sole leather, which is, like, tougher, sturdier stuff. Um, but you need a knife and you need the ability to sharpen your knife. So get like, you know, a sharpening stone, a good one, a strop, that sort of thing. Um, you need an awl. I tend to like the curved ones, um, that sort of thing. It's actually like curved at the end, but this is a lighter weight one that I'm able to find. It's actually a vintage blade, so it's hard to find. Like I said, all these, all of these halves, all of these wooden parts were special made for me. You don't need that, but you can get lots of different shoemakers alls um, from different shoemaker sites, whether it's um, in the US, I really like um, Sorrel Notions and Findings. Sorrel is S-O-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Um, and in the UK, there's Kara Ducker, um, C-A-R-R-E, Ducker, like duck or um, and they have, and there's so many others too. I just know those two pretty well. Um, and you can get those things. So like you need to start off with the knife and the ability to sharpen it, you're all. And from there, you kind of get to choose what route you're going in terms of, do you want to work with boar bristles or do you want to use the plastic or metal alternatives for the shoemaking needles? Cause they're not stiff needles. They're meant to be bendy. Um, do you, you know, getting things like tallow, so that way it's, it's your grease, it's what allows you to get through with the awl a little bit easier. Um, you'll need a hammer. This is where I really recommend going online and going to like eBay. Um, this is a repro hammer, but I've gotten antiques pretty easily. Um, the only thing that you will probably need to do once you get a nice shoemaking hammer um, this is, I think, a French style, but there's lots of different shapes that you can do. You need to polish the heck out of it because it's not actually used on metal. You use it on your leather. Um, and so you get super, super, super shiny, like you can see. <laughs> you can see it as a mirror. Um, and that is like your precious. If anyone tries to actually hammer a nail with it, you knock them over the head. Um, the thing that you actually use for hammers is, hammering nails is this, um, lasting pliers. Again, super easy to find on eBay and all those sorts of places. Um, they still make modern ones. You can get them off of those shoemaking websites, but again, you can get an antique, super cheap um, as well. So I definitely recommend looking at both of those, but yeah, this is, you use the actual grip of it to pull and then this little bit here for the hammering. And that's like your main kit. There are other weird things that you're going to need like threads and wax and stuff like that. Um, but start with that. Start with like, that's, that's your main thing. You need a knife and all something to actually hit metal with and something to just hit your leather with. That's most of it. Um, for me, it's like the rest of this is variations on all size or variations on um, the type of knife that I use, or I have some really weird tools. Like this one is a more modern tool that's meant for dealing with the edges of your leather and I have like because I found when I was doing um all the curvy stuff because I do that's I know the next part that everyone wanted to know like where do you get your heels where do you get your lasts um that's the complicated part for historical things so I carve most of mine to begin with so I have a spoon knife so 
it's great for getting into those little curves that are in uh, all of your heels and things. And I also have like push piece, where did the push one go, is that it? Um, like push blades, which are so sharp, um, as I learned, they're great, but that's the only time I've cut into myself properly. <laughs> like I, I went and pushed and it just, it slid through it like butter so fast, it just went right through my leather apron and right into my leg. So that was fun. That's the only time I've really properly injured myself. Like you get little nicks and cuts, but they tend to be kind of like when you're sewing, you're more likely to get yourself with the pins than you are with your scissors. That's the same way in shoemaking. You're more likely to get yourself by rubbing up against the tacks than you are by actually dealing with the knife. So I guess that's kind of the other thing you probably want to get a, a leather working apron for safety. Uh, most of the time you're working towards yourself and you obviously don't want to do that to yourself yourself. So get something that is resistant. Um, mine I made out of a specific sheep skin on top. So it's it you can't cut through it. Like you just can't. <laughs> like that's the joke you can sit here and like try to stab yourself you can't um so that's really cool but it it doesn't it's kind of like hand sewing versus machine sewing you don't need a really big machine or anything crazy like that um so i'm gonna start because i know i found a few questions up there so i'm gonna scroll back up to the beginning um but to sum up parts because we talked about lasts and heels I make my own. Um, so you can also find vintage um, and you can also get things that you've made reproduced. So I've been very fortunate in that, that this, for example, is one that I've made. Um, it's made most of my um, work that I do for lasts is out of a lighter weight wood. This is not like a balsa wood. It's um, like I usually work with rainbow poplar or stuff of that nature when I can. Same thing with the heels. Rainbow poplar is like my go-to um, for most of my stuff because it's hard enough to function for what I need it to, but it's soft enough that I don't want to kill myself over carving it. Don't go much heavier than that. You seriously just, I've done it. Don't, don't. <laughs> In fact, I've even, I've even made a last um, out of basically balsa wood, like super, super lightweight. Um, and this won't last you <laughs> very long, um, but it was a one-off for a specialty custom size and style that I didn't have a last for at the time. And so I went ahead and carved it up super fast. Um, so if you're only doing a couple pairs of shoes, or if you're going to do a pair of shoes, test it out, and then send it off to a place that can reproduce your last, um, which does exist. The Most of my lasts are reproduction ones um, that are done by a place in Mexico. Um, I have not personally worked with them, but the person that taught me, Brett, did. Um, so we would send off my version of the lasts and they would send back a full range of sizes. Um, so that's how I have most of those. But like I said, for when I've got super specialty things, like this was meant for a pair of 1860s boots that I had to make very precisely the right shape. Um, it was meant to be as close of a reproduction as I could get to the original. So I carved this. The difficulty with this sort of thing is that it is a right and a left. Um, 18th century are straight, meaning you got one, there's not a difference, and it changes on your feet. Like, you know, you end up, you end up very much with a right and a left shoe um, before too long. <laughs> so you don't really get a choice in that, but I can carve my own lass. It's not fun, but it's definitely feasible. And same thing goes with the heels. You can carve your own heels. Um, in fact, that's what I will always choose to do. There we go. It's like, where'd you go? So this is a great example of one of the heels that I've carved. Um, this is for a pair of riding boots that I started and was bested by. I need to go back and actually properly make them. But for right now, I use it as an example. Um, and <laughs> so again, I usually use rainbow poplar for this. Um, it's just, as you can tell, it's really hard to carve out this sort of curve. I am not super skilled in this. Um, I have talked to people that would be better at woodworking than I am, and they're like, yeah, those, those are not fun. So it's not just a me thing, um, thankfully. But yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> like, that's the hardest part, is the stuff that, as a shoemaker, you wouldn't have historically done. Um, they had last makers, they had heel makers. Shoemakers had other people make the uppers for their shoes, all the fabric or the upper parts that don't require, like, leather or... Um, 
interesting, like shoemaking stitches. So you don't have to do that historically, but like, ooh. Yeah, so, all right. I'm gonna scroll back up to the top and I'm gonna start going through some of your guys' questions. Um, because I know, like I said, a lot of the questions were, where do I even get this stuff? Those, those couple of places, how do you get started in this? Learning through modern classes. Um, and then you go from there. It's really hard to get information off of historic shoes online, unfortunately. Um, so if you're ever able to actually go in, even house museums, like small, tiny museums usually have shoes. It's just one of those things. Um, so, you know, like that's a, a fortunate thing. Um, but yeah, someone does mention the um, Every Woman Her Own Shoemaker book that was from, I believe, the 1850s. Um, as much as I love the concept of that book, it is not functional for modern day in the same way. There are some very useful things in there about how they assembled shoes. However, um, the issue comes from the fact that it tells you in the very first step to go to your local shoemaker and have them give you a last and the supplies that you need. So you can get your sole leather from them, you can get your upper stuff from them, you can get you can get all your stuff from your local shoemaker. You can't, obviously. <laughs> so that's one of the, the biggest issues that I have with that book is that it doesn't explain in modern terms where to get a last, where to get the parts that you need, um, where to get the supplies and the shoemaking tools and what leathers you need and all of that stuff. So like there's a huge gap um, in the fact that that book is just not meant for that. So yeah. <laughs> um, wait one second. And Let's see, what are some of the fun questions I've been getting? So I actually find that um, dealing with comfort, so I guess that's another good topic. Um, I find these shoes incredibly comfortable, even though they don't always look like they should be, they are. Um, they're just different. So you have to get used to it. You actually walk differently in the shoes. Um, so this boot is a great example. Um, it's a copy. This is the one that the last was made for and it's a copy of an original that's at the New England Historic Society We know the woman that owned it and wore it and we have the receipts for it and everything. So it's 1864 and They like this was made to fit me and I upped the size just barely um, But it looks incredibly tiny and narrow in person um, And that's because they actually do vertical height rather than horizontal. So the measurement overall is the same um, but it's not the way we're used to seeing it. And so modern shoes tend to go very wide and very flat. And they do this under the argument that you need that space for your foot to spread. It's the same measurement, they just put in a different way. Um, so plug it in up there. Oh, I'm not sure that'll work, but we'll try. Um, so that's like, the constant issue that you deal with is the, just the difference in where the shape actually occurs. And it's really a trick because, <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, it It's all deception. So it's really hard to explain it, but it it's all there. It's just the argument that you need it with your natural foot shape. And the reason for that is because modern shoes are incredibly hard. They are not flexible. They are not soft. We expect them to be like an iron cage for our foot that our foot fits inside of them and they are a protective layer. Um, in reality, 18th century, 19th century, and even into the early 20th century women's shoes, they're very soft. Like this is padded, but it's just fabric. So there's nothing stopping my foot, once it has enough measurement, from spreading it out as much as it needs to, moving, flexing my foot. It's more like those um, knit top things or the stretchy ones that are meant to like form over your foot. And, uh, so they fit very differently. So when people look at say, even the heavier leather shoes of the 18th and 19th century and go, oh my gosh, their feet would have been tortured. They clearly put style over comfort they didn't. It just fits very differently. We don't produce leather like that very much anymore. Um, I actually, for the most part, 
like to use kangaroo leather. I do use calf and I do use goat occasionally, but it's usually very expensive stuff. Um, but the closest that I found to 18th century shoe leather is kangaroo because it is so stretchy. And ironically, yes, kangaroo leather is stretchy and bounces back. That That's its like main thing. Um, but like it's it's so hard to actually achieve that level of comfort in modern shoes because they're so structured. Um, so they really don't need to prioritize comfort over any sort of appearance on the shoe. They just need to learn more about people's feet and how they balance um, the heels on these things are not like modern shoes. The very like modern shoes are completely straight down the back. Like that's one of those things, especially right now, some of them even flare out. Like that's not, that's not how, when you come down on your heel, that's not where it needs to be. That, that's really awkward. That puts the pressure and the impact on the back of your foot rather than actually directly up your leg. And it just, it doesn't work and it's really uncomfortable. And I, I had weak ankles and I know there was a discussion about that, um, in one of my areas and it, like one of the, um, notifications that I had of this and the whole weak ankle myth. Um, I had weak ankles um, when I was younger. And as somebody said, that's medically not even actually a thing. Um, but I sprained and twisted my ankles repeatedly throughout my childhood, like over and over and over again. And that was just wearing regular shoes. That wasn't wearing high heels. That was wearing literally like tennis shoes. Um, and it's just... It wasn't until, and I wore high heels all the way through college, um, and I dealt with it, and I strengthened, and I did dance, so my ankles weren't weak. They were very strong. I did lots of different types of dance, so they shouldn't have been a problem. Um, but what I discovered was all of my heels were not tilted the right way. They were not anchored in the right spot. They were too small, or they were too, they just proportionally didn't work, and it didn't support the foot. So that was sort of my, like, realization of, oh, that's the problem. Um, like, that's the issue. <laughs> so the comfort issue that we're finding with modern shoes is fixing problems that were created by modern shoes. Um, they aren't fixing problems that were created in the 18th century or even the 19th century. They're fixing problems that were created in the 1950s, the 1990s, um, all of those issues. So everything just really requires that. So, all right, I'm trying to kind of go through and see what some of the general questions are. There's a lot of them, so it's hard for me to catch everything. Um, but yeah, how many shoes would a person own? Um, it really varies, like how many shoes does the average person own today? Um, one thing I can tell you is that in the colonies, we have records of the church giving three pairs a year to the absolutely destitute, those that could not afford anything on their own, those that could not have a job and could not get money and were under the support of the church. They had three pairs a year given to them. And we don't have records of whether that was three new pairs or three repairs, or if those three pairs of shoes got repairs multiple times for free. Um, but yeah, so that's bare minimum. And there's this great story in the 18 teens which is not a true story. I, I, like, I don't believe it's a true story, but it gives you the information that therefore is probably factual because why would they make that part up? Um, that's not the point of the story. But it's a father talking about all these things that he's teaching, is, he's getting his daughters taught how to do so they have hobbies and they can learn how to do the fashionable things. And one of the things is learning how to make shoes. And he goes through and lists out the like five to eight pairs of shoes a year that he buys for these girls. And he's like, each, and he's like, I'll save so much money if they can make their own shoes. And then they learn how to make one pair and they end up with hunchback and gnarled fingers because shoemaking is not friendly. And they end up making one pair of shoes that they never wear and they both place them on little sheets of gold paper in their rooms and they never touch them. And he's just so upset that he paid so much money to have them trained and how to make, he paid an entire year's worth of shoes to learn shoemaking and they never do it. So like, I always found that amusing. Um, so that's a good example of more like everyday wear and tear that you would expect, um, that sort of thing. So getting five pairs a year, 10 pairs a year, depends on how fashionable you are. That's pretty normal. 
And there are definitely examples, like I said, of shoes that have been worn and um, kept around. Most of the shoes that you find surviving are not heavily worn, if at all. I think since shoes were mass produced as of the 18th century, there's just, I think, a lot of shoes that just never got sold. Um, or shoes that were bought in bulk at the Philadelphia Museum of Fine Art. They have, I think, five or six pairs of the exact same black silk satin 1770s shoes that were bought by the same person. They all came from the same house. Um, and she clearly bought in a bulk and just never wore all of them. Didn't make it through. She tried to alter one pair to look different. She got rid of the, the latchet straps that go across the, the top for the buckle here and tried to make it more of this style um, by cutting off the latchets on one of them, but clearly didn't think that actually worked out well because then she didn't wear do it to another one and didn't wear them ever. So like there are some things like that that get done, but yeah, she was buying in like five, six pairs at a time at least. So like, so clearly like she expected that, like what the reason why those survived wasn't because they didn't fit or they had problems, but just simply because they went out of style and she's just like, eh. So like if people are buying them in like five pairs at a time. <laughs> um, so, okay, back to the comfort thing. Cause I know there's still questions on that. So these are not as thin as they look. It's, it's deceptive. Um, just the very edge is that thin. They're, they're much thicker on the inside. Um, you also have an insole and I generally put cork or wool in between the two um, because when you last over the uppers and you have your seam allowance, there's a big gap in the middle. So I actually fill it with the cushion that is a waterproofing um, as well. So they're very comfortable. Like I said, I've walked miles and miles and miles in these shoes. I can do heavier soles. These are turn shoes. These are as light as they get. So if you're say like somebody who's walking hard and heavy, um, that's when you go with your heavier like channel shoes that are like this has a clump sole ripped off. but. That's when you go with heavier channel shoes. They're much thicker on the side. Um, or you go with a randed or a welted shoe. Um, so you can get, again, the thicker sole. And it's sturdy. It's hardy. Like, it it wears really long. Um, and it's actually very comfortable. It It's just more like wearing... Because your foot's able to actually move and adjust. And you're not stuck within a hard stiff outer your foot can actually move and adjust and work over things a lot easier so when you're say walking down cobblestones or across gravel or across the ground and in modern shoes that's what constantly made me twist my ankle and lose my balance um was the fact that there was no it was all resistance if I stepped on a tiniest rock my entire foot had to go off to the side and so while I will feel that rock slightly in my 18th century shoes, there's it's it's not a princess in the pea thing. Like you don't feel every tiny little pebble, but my foot was able to actually somewhat form over that and not <laughs> not just keel over. So I found it much easier walking in these shoes around the historic area um, than I ever did in modern shoes. I I wouldn't be able to do modern heels in like Colonial Williamsburg. Um, I tried a few times. It was not good. Um, I always had to do flats. So. Like that was the difference. So it seems like it would be less comfortable, but it really wasn't. Like you just, you walk differently. There's um, in the 1860s or 70s, um, I don't remember when exactly the article came out, as heels came back in in the 1850s, but not everybody necessarily picked them up right away. And there was a discussion of how do you relearn how to walk? So you walk differently in flats than you do in heels. And you walk very differently in modern heels than you do in historic heels. Um, so their description of how to learn how to walk in a heel so you don't hurt yourself because they specify that was one of the reasons why women were hurting themselves in high heels and causing ankle problems was because they weren't walking right. Um, not because of the heels problem, but they weren't doing it right. Was to take a flat shoe and attach a squeaky ball where the heel should be, about the size of the heel. And you need to learn how to walk around without squeaking that ball. <laughs> Which is just, like, the visual <laughs> of this was absolutely amazing. Um, just, I... Yeah, it was, like, I, I just pictured this woman in her beautiful cage crinoline gown, like, walking around her house trying to <laughs> squeak, 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 squeak. Like, it's just, it's brilliant. Um, but it makes sense, because you don't, you actually, like, you don't come down toe first, but you come down very flat, and you slide forward into it. And so you get your steps that way, rather than ka -thunk. Like, modern heels, you have to come down, and you hit, 
and then you then you move forward and so you hit that heel impact hard and that is what's stressful for your ankles and your legs and your hips like that is that's that that constant impact is the problem you can't do that in these shoes i've tried it's so hard to walk in these shoes like that um so yeah you do essentially have to like and i did a whole bunch of videos i'll have to post but you do kind of come in like you hit very much at the same time like i sometimes get a little bit of a heel but like that would be it rather than coming bump bump so that that difference in walking makes all the difference in terms of how it impacts your body and all of those studies that are being done on like how bad high heels are for your body and why we need to move to these fancy shoes with all these weird shapes and like all of these things to fix that it's like not really and someone mentioned like why are clogs so comfortable like the why are wedges so comfortable i can't i cannot stand wedges they are incredibly uncomfortable to me interestingly enough um but part of that is just because that I've noticed people in wedges tend to walk more like that. They tend to walk more flat rather than thunking. Um, so I think that might be part of it. I'm really curious. I would love to do a whole bunch of just like people have done modern um, studies on how people walk in different shoes. Most of them tend to be not looking at the actual health or anything like that. Most of these shoes and walking and high heels studies that I saw um, were looking at how men versus women walk in shoes. And could you actually tell based off of the walk of a skeleton, whether it was like what, what gender the person identified as and like all of that. So that, which helped greatly in terms of seeing how the walking was done, but was not useful in terms of understanding like health problems due to all of that. So like I said, I think most of the like, these shoes are uncomfortable. It's just because like, if you look at vintage shoes, frankly, and even modern shoes, they're so, oh God, they're so uncomfortable. Um, so, yep, yep, yep. Um, but the diff but some of the difference is not just like where the heels place, but it's also just the softness of the shoe. Like this is a pretty hard one, but there's no shanks in these. Um, and that's one of the other th like important things is like the heel on this functions to support the arch of the foot, but there's, it's like a dance shoe. Um, and the fact that it doesn't have, it's very flexible there. Um, but you won't find modern shoes that are that lightweight on top and that lightweight on bottom. Um, people wouldn't buy them because they'd go, oh, this is a slipper. I can't wear this outside and fall apart. So, and they expect it to last 20 years, um, which you can if you like really take care of it. Um, but that flexibility is just not there in modern shoes. Um, and so you, like with the, with the stiff shank and the stiff shoal and the heavier uppers, um, it's just, you're going to still walk like a normal modern shoe, just a little bit. It's still going to be better because look at the, if you're looking at like repro historic shoes, the heel is still under the foot properly. Um, so that's why like I can wear those for hours and I cannot wear modern shoes for hours. Like I'm trying to find a modern pair of boots and I just, I want to like rip the heels off of all of them. They're so bad. Like, they're, like backwards, like what, what? Mm. Mm. I'm not happy about that. Okay, so what else do you guys want to hear about? The rounded soles. Um, I don't know. I've never tried them. I've seen lots of people wearing the the rocker ones where the sole is actually like rounded. Um, and it, it makes some sense, but usually you have what's called toe spring anyway, which means that the toe is not flat onto the ground. You're certainly not doing that. Your toe is slightly lifted, um, so that way you can do that anyway. Um, it's just usually not that extreme, but I have a feeling it's one of those things where it's better for certain medical reasons or certain types of gates. And like, that's the sort of thing that I feel like we don't, we don't talk about or we don't learn about at any point in time is that people walk differently and people's feet hit the ground differently. And that's not just your foot shape. That's also dependent on your knee and your hips and the strength of it. If you have like low, like you don't have good hip flexors, you're going to walk differently than if you've say been doing ballet for your entire life and you can like lift your leg up. No problem. Everybody moves and walks differently and has different turnouts or turn ins or weight, like impact areas. Um, and nobody really pays attention to that. 
I guess is a good way to put it. Like no one really spends the time to get to know that because it's, it's so incredibly difficult. Like those those Dr. Scholl's things now where you can like stand on it and it'll tell you what sort of weight distribution you have on your foot. That's a good start, but it doesn't tell you about how you walk, which your wear pattern on your shoes can tell you a lot. Um, like I can say like, this is my right shoe. Um, and so this is where my big toe would be. And that's where I, I put a lot of wear and tear there. I don't have like a turn out where like I don't have I don't walk on the outside of my foot I put most of my wear there um, but on my heel it's on the outside so that means that I have a slight bit of a turnout because like my wear pattern is here and then angles towards the front toe so I have a little bit of a turnout in my feet thank you years of dance um, and that's why that wear pattern happens there versus like turning that way or you know having the shoe cant inwards um, so I know like where my issues are with that and like what I might choose to do to the shoes to adjust that if it becomes like painful at some point. Um, I might need to work on adjusting my posture and my hip position rather than being like, oh, it's the shoe's fault or it's my foot's fault. It's like, it's the position of my hips um, that's causing that wear and causing me to have, when I have pain in my feet, it's um, the where the big toe is like that joint that's where the pain in my foot happens. Um, and that is due to the fact that I have that turnout. It's not due to the fact that the shoes are problematic. Um, usually like if they are, they are, but like that's stuff like that, which is again, another thing that you learn in shoemaking. Um, there's a lot like, uh, there's so much um, medical stuff in there that I still don't know. Um, I'm learning as I go and I've learned by talking to people, but I haven't taken any medical courses. I would love to, but that is not the easiest thing to necessarily be like, I just want to take a single class on feet. Where the heck do I, like online, where do I do that? Um, I've looked, there might be some place now, but when I looked a few years ago, I couldn't find an example. So, oh. but yeah, so obviously what, I do is very similar to modern shoemaking, but there's different degrees of different types. So this is handmade, even when I'm cementing them together, like in the case of this shoe, the original was cemented together, um, which is the same way that modern shoes are done, kind of. Um, and you know, it's still very different than, <laughs> obviously, than modern shoes. Um, but I don't use all the machinery. I don't know how to use any of that machinery. I, I've learned a little bit, um, but, there's just not that much and it's a whole different field when you're getting things mass produced that is a whole different type of shoemaking um, a whole different type of shoe design than the custom ones so that that is its own thing that <sighs> um, so there's lots of different types of shoemaking industry as it was um, so are the shoes slippery uh, a little bit um, as you can see, like as you wear them, they 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 rough up um, versus the ones that are. I've only worn these inside, um, and so this is burnished to look nice and shiny and pretty, um, and darkened a little bit. But you can you can leave the sole suede, which is this part here. Um, I took a sandpaper to it. Um, it suede's it up so it's more like a dance shoe. So there's still some slipperiness to it, um, but again, the way that you walk it makes it really a lot harder to slip in these shoes. Um, the first few ones that I wore and I was still, you know, hitting and coming down, like I would hit, come down and then I'd slide forward and be like, yeah. um, but when I came down with the expectation of like, this is my stopper, this is, it's almost like ice skating <laughs> in certain ways, like a rollerblading or something like this is my stopper, um, that, you know, there's resistance there. And I found that I, I ended up slipping less. Um, I'm careful when I say go down wooden stairs, um, but I managed to never die when I was working at the millinery shop at Colonial Williamsburg and those stairs, I was there before they put the safety things on the stairs. <laughs> like so many people fell down the stairs. I never did. So it's, it's possible to not die in these. Um, but once they rough up, they're really fast. And there are certain things you can do. Like I made this pair of overshoes um, for a pair of shoes that I actually left at Williamsburg since the red inside was a red pair of shoes. Um, and I know people always talk about like, oh, you just put these on and this will be your heavy shoe for walking around town or you can make it with like a rougher sole or these things are not walking friendly 
at all. Neither are the patents, which are the ones with the metal rings underneath. Um, so overshoes are not... <laughs> they're for bad weather. And they're for taking your fancy little pretty shoes from the carriage to the house. I wore them the first day that I wore them. I was going to a fancy evening event. And getting from my parking lot, like from my car in the parking lot, around the building to the front of the building, they fell off of my feet like five times. Because I had to learn how to walk all over again. Um, you have to actually push your foot into it every single step and it flip-flops um, because it's stiff like a wedge but your shoe isn't and so it made me realize how much my shoe actually flexes all the time and so I was constantly flip-flopping this thing in the back and when I went up the stairs it just fell off of my foot every single time and so I'd have to like stomp into it to go up the stairs <laughs> so they wouldn't fall off and it was so bad so like these are not walking friendly and I have other people that I know that have tried similar ones, the same sort of thing. They, they're there for inclement weather and not long walking. Like it's just not gonna happen. Um, like just, I think it probably fit this one in there. But yeah, every single step you take, this just, that happens. <laughs> but it's not so far up on the foot that when you do that, it's really easy for that to slip out. So you gotta really push down in every single time. Um, so, ugh. Yeah, like they're really cool and I will probably make another pair at some point that is a little less intensive than that one. That was, that was terrible. I, I, that was the hardest thing I've ever made. Um, out of all the shoes, even out of my, like not my first pair of shoes, that pair of overshoes was the most difficult thing I have ever made in terms of shoemaking. So um, yeah, <laughs> which part of it, um, was due to the fact that, like, I probably used heavier leather than I should have and, like, other things like that. So, oh, leather, that's a good, that's a good topic. Um, so you can get sole leather from some of those shoemaking supplies places. Um, I recently got some sole leather from Tandy that I'm trying out. It's lightweight and would work for turn shoes. I'm not sure how durable it is. Um, that's kind of the difference in quality versus, like, the really expensive, proper, like, super nice sole leather. It will last for a very long time. Um, but... The difference between sole leather and regular leather is that sole leather is very... Regular leather is much more fleshy, meaning that, like, there's, like, fuzzy on the inside and you can you can put holes through it and it might stay or it might pull out. Sole leather is, like, compacted and hard and, like, no matter how deep you go with that all, it's not going to pull out. Like, you, you can't pull out stitches. <laughs> so that's the point of, of sole leather. Upper leather... I said I get from a variety of places. Um, I stick to ve vegetable tanned leather rather than chrome tanned leather um, for a variety of reasons. I just find it better to work with. It's historically what they would have used. Um, but I have a whole list of, of places and I'll, I'll make up a post on that at some point of places that I get from. A lot of them are actually book binding places, not shoemaking. Um, so I use a lot of book binding calf and goat. Um, also, like I said, kangaroo, um, cause that's like a good weight for shoe uppers. Um, so that, yeah, but like the thing to look for in good shoe leather is that it can hold a stitch well, meaning that I can put my all through it and it won't pull out. So with kangaroo or something like that, sorry, <laughs> basically if I can get into my bin really fast, um, that's goat, but should still work. So it's really thin. This is a like a rock and goat. Um, but I can take my awl and go through, like it's only, like it, that's super thin, like that's not, it's not a thick leather at all. But I can take my small awl, which is appropriate for this size, and I can go through half of its thickness, say, come out the other side. That's not a good spot. But theoretically, that's one of the reasons why I'm not using this for one of the things. Um, it's a little bit more fleshy than say the kangaroo which is on the other side of the room um but you can put your all through it and pull up and it won't pop out uh, which means that the stitch will hold and that's kind of important um you don't want your stitch to just pull through the fabric <laughs> as it were um so that's one of the reasons why i really like kangaroo because it is so resilient in that way even though it's incredibly lightweight um cast skin i use go for some things but yeah so <laughs> i get it, finding the right leather is, that's the hard part. And it's very expensive. Um, so I just recently bought a single kangaroo hide, which is one of the cheaper leathers to get. And that was, I believe about 150 for the upper, for that leather. Um, 
calf skin, depending on what you're going for, it can be 150, it can be 300. Um, if I'm doing a full hide of Wittal, which is tawed leather rather than tanned leather, and it's white, um, and it's much more expensive, I can end up paying $600 for a single hide, um, calf skin hide of that. So yeah, it's that's where that's where it gets expensive. Um, let's see if I can find the kangaroo leather that's underneath me or not. I don't think I can. Gotcha. So this is the kangaroo leather I just made my medieval shoes out of. Um, so it's got a lot of good like stretch and give to it. Um, but like I said, it's very, it returns to where it came from, which is kind of important. So this is just a standard like medium weight kangaroo. Um, see the backside's not terribly fleshy. It's not like really super fuzzy. It's a soft velvety, but it's not fuzzy. Um, and this holds stitches really well, even though it's really thin. So I can actually do like half st stitch through the thickness of this, even though it's only a couple millimeters thick. Um, so that's one of the ones that I really like using for things. Um, but <laughs> it's not necessarily like easy to work with in any of those cases. It just takes learning the tools. Um, and learning, it's no different than like working with the needle. You gotta learn how it actually like works and functions. Um, but yeah, do I have magic fingers? Um, <laughs> obviously with shoemaking, you're using your awl rather than a needle. So that helps greatly. But when I am using a needle on leather, I do tend, that's the only time I tend to wear a thimble. Um, but it also depends on how resistant the leather is and how like heavy my needles are and things like that. So not always, um, but I tend to sew with bigger needles rather than smaller. So they're less likely to go into my finger, but I also pinch rather than push. So it's just a difference of, of how I function with the needle. So thimbles usually get in the way. And when I have to use them for shoemaking, like doing leather uppers, um, like this sort of thing, this is a calf skin upper. Um, and I had to use um, a thimble to in, you know, stitch on the binding by hand. Um, the problem that I have with that is that the thimble abrades the thread and so I have to use much shorter thread and keep like nodding and starting over and starting over. I don't like that. I'm, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like shredding my thread like that. Um, and I know I could use a different type of thimble. That's the thing people always say, oh, I don't have to use metal. If it's so hard that I can't push it through myself, it will go through a leather needle, a leather thimble, and it will go through the silicone ones. I have put so many holes in those. <laughs> they don't they don't work for me because if it takes that much effort, I can't actually push with those. They're, my finger strength is tough enough for that. So yeah. <laughs> Who makes custom historic shoes? Uh, um, for men, Sean Picard is like, he is so, so skilled. Um, he, he started learning around the same time I did and like getting to watch his process of things has been so cool. Um, I don't know who makes like women's 18th century shoes. I don't know if anybody does. Like I know there are some companies that do um, 18th century inspired ones that do custom. Um, I haven't tried their stuff. I don't know how custom they work. Um, way back in the day, there was Sarah Juniper. Um, I originally bought a pair of shoes from her before everything, I, before I learned everything. And um, she doesn't do historic shoes anymore. So I can comfortably now say, I learned how to do shoemaking because of those shoes, because they were not what I needed or wanted. And it was a very, I spent a lot of money on something that was, didn't work for me. Um, so I was like, I need to do this myself. Um, like I'm, I think she still does vegan shoes, which is like cool and all. Um, I don't want to deal with vegan leather because I don't, okay. Sit down for a minute. Actually, I should probably holding a teacup while I do this. So <laughs> as much as I totally understand being vegan, I, I fully get that. I grew up in a vegetarian household, whatever. Um, there are not, there are not any viable options right now. There are a few specialty vegan leathers that I probably could do shoemaking, like hand shoemaking with. Um, I'm not sure about putting stitches through them. They probably have to be cemented, but they're specialty, they're very expensive, um, and they're very hard to get a hold of, and they're very limited quality quantities, and usually they're made specifically for certain shoe brands that will use them, and they aren't publicly available. 
the rest that are publicly available, um, like Apple Leather or PLU, those are all plastic. Apple Leather has PLU in it. Most of them have plastic in them, and I, I don't. Um, your shoes don't breathe, they don't flex, they don't shape to your foot, they're not comfortable, and you leave behind a plastic shoe, that thing will never go away. Um, I, I can wear these things to death, keep refreshing them, keep fixing them up, keep rehydrating them, and they even the ones that I have killed, I could, I could fix and continue to wear. Um, I leave them in the state that they're in because they're good examples for educational purposes. Um, but I could continue to wear them for years and years, and I have never managed a plastic pair of shoes to do that and there's nothing once it's once it's ripped you're that's it like once you've abraded it that's it um and they will go in a landfill so i would much rather like it's much less impactful on the environment to do leather um and it's much less damaging to animals because it's a byproduct all of this stuff is byproduct um so like none of the leather that i use was is from animals that were specifically raised for leather so like i i am so much more comfortable um, with that. So, yeah, um, Christine Sostein had, um, some specialty things made. I just don't know if they do specialty sizes or, like, custom fits. I know they do custom, like, fabrics. Like, you can send them a fabric, um, so who knows. Um, but yes, look at Sostein. Um, I've looked at other methods. Um, I've actually purchased over the years, um, a few different shoes from different places i have some um my husband was in the navy and he picked up shoes for me when he was in bahrain and dubai in that area um so i've looked at those and it's the same thing they use slightly different tools and slightly different angles but it's the same stitch <laughs> it's the same basic construction it's like all right again yeah um like there's just it just works um would cork have been used so no i haven't tried to work with other leathers just because they don't I'd have to spend so much money to get them and they're hard to get. Like if someone has a source for just like small hides of things, I'll gladly try them. But I've never found a source for like small things that don't have PLU in them. Um, but these have cork in them. Like this little part underneath here is, is cork. Um, I generally will use cork or wool broadcloth to fill in the center space. Um, so I use cork there, but I haven't like cork leather is not something I've um, worked with. Or anything like that. So, um, to weatherproof and maintain your shoes, hydrate like your own skin because it's it's skin. Um, so, I burnish the bottom of my shoes, and you can use mink oil, which does darken the bottom of your shoes. You can use yeah. There's some beeswax used in the process. Like I said, I do that inner layer, um, which helps on the sole in terms of either cork or um, wool. Wool broadcloth is really good for that, and I've got scraps of that left over from sewing. So that's where my like my heavy wool broadcloth scraps from years of making menswear for other people. Um, that's where those get used. Um, so there's, there's things to do with waterproofing there. Like I said, my big heavy ones, these things, they're pretty, like it took a lot of walking through puddles before my feet would get wet. Um, and nights where things were super rainy or snowy, I would wear wool socks, wool stockings, and my feet were usually pretty dry. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I never really was like concerned, like my feet stayed as dry as they would in, in other shoes. Um, like rubber sold things maybe like a little bit better, but I, it took a lot, a lot of walking outside in very inclement weather for my feet to get wet when I was wearing the right shoes. And I wasn't always wearing the right shoes. And there were days where, oh, great example of that. So <laughs> there was a day when I was working, um, on, uh, the tent project at Williamsburg, we were reproducing George Washington's tent, and we were, um, unfortunately, the closest um, place to park your car to that was the parking lot that always flooded. And we had an absolute deluge one day. It was supposed to rain, but it, like, rained. And it was up to, like, people's calves <laughs> in the parking lot. It was bad. Um, and I had, like, an, I think I had my little velvet shoes on for that day and was, like, no, that's not good. I don't want to ruin these. So I wore my leather slippers because they were already kind of nearing a death point And I figured I could my feet were gonna get wet anyway, no matter what I did um, And because they're leather they're gonna get less damaged than that And they're now permanently formed to what my foot looked like when <laughs> the day that I wore them and they dried out on my foot <laughs> Like I could still wear them, but they're just so stiffened. It's hilarious to me So I've just kind of like left them because that was near the end of the project anyway 
Um, but you can see all these wrinkles and like my, my toe shape like very distinctly. It's hilarious. So that's a great example of how the shoes form to right and left. Um, you don't need to wet them down for that, but if you do, they're really great. <laughs> so that's what happens when you get your shoes absolutely soaking wet. They're still fine. Um, you just don't like put them on heat or anything to dry, just let them dry by air. Like that's the key thing with anything with, with actual leather. Um, so yeah. Yeah, sheepskin. That'd be an interesting experiment. Sheepskin, like I said, can be rough and tough, but it doesn't wear in the same way that cow or calf does um, for, for sole. So yeah, cork leather for bags, actually. I have a, I ordered a cork leather bag that I'm really curious to, to get next year. Um, so like, I'm curious about those things, but right now there's just, I haven't found anything that's a good option. Um, so yeah, the hard part though, learning shoemaking. Uh, yeah, because that's the question that kept coming up over and over and over again. And it's just, like, you got to take your own path on that. My path is not feasible for anybody at the moment. Um, I'd like to teach more, but yeah, making a book on it. And I did actually write kind of a book years ago. It's on blurb. So it's like 18th century turn shoe making, like um, how to make 18th century turn shoes or something. Like it's not a step-by-step how-to. Um, so it's definitely not titled that, but yeah, I think it's just 18th century turn shoes. Um, but it shows you all of the parts. It just doesn't go into details like what leather weight do you need and what size of all blade or exactly. It just kind of talks about the process. Um, and I'll be doing more shoemaking and lots of videos. So there'll be a lot to see from that in the near future. Um, you can definitely pick up a lot from that, but I definitely recommend just getting a strong basis in modern shoemaking. Um, because you, the stuff that you need to understand is like how to fit to the foot, how to measure the foot. Like that's the stuff that is universal. Um, the exact techniques of how you pattern might be slightly different, but frankly, there are times where, yes, I do cover my last in masking tape and draw the shoe on it. That's, that's cool. Like, um, I did that for this pair, which is my 1920 pair. Um, and that's complicated stuff right there, folks. Like I would do it a lot differently now if I could uh, did this again. Um, it's just way too thick for what I want. Um, everything just too much bulk. So I would definitely rework that. But this is not something that I'm gonna do on a paper pattern. I, I wrapped it in masking tape and I drew all the lines on the last and took it off and like flattened things because you're working in 3D. Um, the leather will stretch and work around but you kind of need to know how to account for that and flatten out your pattern. Um, but yeah, this, like, <laughs> this requires a lot of, a lot of detail that I'm not going to get from my 18th century um, techniques or like what I did in the medieval shoemaking. Like that, just wrapping paper around it, that's great for simple things, um, but not so much for the complex things. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, actually, interesting note, wooden shoes filled with straw for warmth. Um, I haven't seen straw in records, but I have seen wool, like just um, straight wool. So that's actually one of the things that they talk about a lot in the 19th century, um, is that they will have inserts, kind of like extra insoles made out of wool that you will put inside of your shoe. Um, and that's another way to prevent like the cold or the damp coming through, because they were like stupidly concerned with warm, dry feet in the 19th century. Like, a good chunk of my thesis, my, my master's thesis was written on that. <laughs> really concerned about it. Um, and so having insoles, and you can actually still buy them today. You can buy just wool felt insoles. Totally, highly recommend them. Super cushy, super comfy. Um, keep your feet warm and dry. So if you have any of those issues with your shoes, you can still get those. Um, so that, that is, yeah, yeah, I, I, hopefully someday I can write a book on this. Um, for right now, you'll just get some beautiful, like, film footage, um, and then eventually I'll do a better book at some point. But the, the one that you can get off of Blurb, you can get a PDF of it too, which I highly recommend. Like, I don't even know what the prices are for their book books anymore, but the PDF is still really cheap. Um, so that's really pretty. But... Do they have proper winter shoes? It depends on the era that we're talking about, whether they specifically had winter shoes or not. When you reach the 19th century, you see that a lot. You see um, fur slippers with like elevated things. Um, so like that's, 
uh, that sort of thing. Um, actually, you can see one of my new beauties. Um, so I've finally admitted that I'm allowed to collect some antique shoes. Um, so this is an 1860s boot. And this is a sturdy as hell boot, as I like to call it. Look how thick that sole is. It's doubled. Like, it's got multiple sole levels. Um, so this is a great example of, like, what do you do for sturdy shoes? This this sucker. And the elevated toe in front, because that was something they were concerned about, having toe space. And they were concerned about not having thick enough soles to deal with the wet and the cold and all of that. Like, this is what they did. And so that's why I actually ended up getting this pair of shoes from Witchy Vintage, because they're a perfect example of, like, healthy shoes for the 1860s. How to be healthful with your shoes. Have leather uppers. Like, they're super lightweight still. Um, I'm gonna hydrate these before too long. I think they really need it. But they're they're still, like, about the same weight as, like, my kangaroo or really, like, calfskin. But, like, that's got a hefty in there. It's big, big, chunky sole. It's done. Um, it's actually done as a channel shoe, which I did not expect. I thought, looking at them, like, oh, it's got two layers. They probably just did a welt. It's a channel shoe. Um, which is just crazy to me, which means that they literally stitch straight up through into the inside of the boot, um, which you could only do in this time period because of this elevation. <laughs> like, I was like, how do you channel a shoe in 1860s shoe? That's a terrible idea. Like, you have to get, because you have to actually get inside of the shoe to do it. Um, it sucks. You have to have tiny, nimble hands for that. <laughs> so, um, so these are, these are a great example of, like, sturdy winter healthy shoes um that would be like good walking shoes for that era um comparison to say like the same same um era this thing where it's just like lightweight wool cotton uppers and some pretty things and like lightweight soles like the sole is heavier than it looks but it's also pretty lightweight still <laughs> like that's the difference um so they do definitely have different styles and they work for different things different amounts of wear no different than today like we have different types of shoes for different things and there were winter boots in certain eras um more and more so as you get into like boots becoming fashionable in the 19th century um but yeah so <laughs> is there a form in that boot nope it's just it's got some stuffing in it um down in the bottom but it doesn't have anything supporting the the, like the, the ankle part it's just when you use leather and it's got a twill lining like a cotton twill on the inside um so it's just stiffer than some of the others but like you know so there are some that are stronger stiffer than others and there are some that are just floppy fabric so like this one is only upright because it's got stuffing literal just stuffing in it <laughs> um but it just doesn't go up all the way. Like, there's some leather stiffener along the buttons. Um, that you can see, like, that's that's where I got the Wittaw in there um, to make sure that there's enough resistance there. And like I said, that's an exact reproduction of an original pair. So as close as I can get. It's not exact, exact. But yeah, interesting. All the different ways that you can uh, keep your feet nice and warm. Cool. <laughs> interesting. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, you can do multiple layers of leather on soles. You can do single layer. You can make it super thin. You can make it very thick. The only thing you can't do is do a really thick sole on a turn shoe because you literally turn it right side out. You start it wrong side out and you got to flip it. It's got to be lightweight enough that you can actually like fold that leather and turn it. Um, you can then add more to it. You could sew another sole on. But, yeah. Um, Roman times or earlier shoes, um, you see that they just have different types of wrapping techniques. So because they weren't necessarily doing like shoes like this, they're they're doing like, things that are more like a piece of leather that wraps around the foot in different ways and sometimes gets partially stitched. Um, they just have ones that wrap up higher and wrap differently, or you can actually wrap. And this continues all the way through um, until modern day and you still see it in certain areas. You can wrap fabric or other leather around your feet to help prevent that. So I mean, no different than like spats. That was the like very elegant, refined version that you've seen like the early 20th century or late 19th, you know, you can wear spats over your shoes to protect your feet. Um, actually spats go back all the way to like beginning of the 19th, but um, like that more so than anything. Protecting your shoes. Ooh. Um, 
just making sure that they dry out slowly and then clean them off. And like, you can get shoe cleaner, get shoe cleaner, get luster cream, which is a hydrating, and just do that every time that they've encountered that. And it sucks that you have to keep doing it, but uh, it's going to be like just making sure you remove and start over again. Um, but yeah. <laughs> like, shoes are engineered. Um, that's the best way to think of it. Like, even historical ones that are super lightweight, there's so much engineering that goes into it. And it's just that historical shoes are hug your feet, modern shoes encase your feet. Like, that's the biggest way to think of the difference. Um, and yeah, hobnails are an option. Like, these these shoes, like, I couldn't do it in, like, my fancy silk shoes, but you could hobnail these, but frankly, I was inside and out, and you don't want to wear hobnails inside. That just, that's how you slip and die, wearing hobnails on a wooden floor. That. <laughs> um, so if you were, say, in a position where you were doing entirely outdoor work and you needed more traction on ground, especially wet ground, yes, hobnail. Um, but it, like, don't overdo the hobnails. That's, that's how you, <laughs> that's how you slip and die. <laughs> um, so I have always avoided those because I've never done anything that required that much outdoor. Like I said, literally just, I walked and walked miles and miles in these in lots of inclement weather. Um, and they've all held up over the years, even the lightweight ones, um, like, you know, super thin slipper things like 1820s, um, like this sort of style. They're, they're very lightweight, but they're not as lightweight as they look. It's deceptive. Um, this is when they were like super concerned about feet. Like they, they had an absolute uproar over women's feet being exposed and too lightweight and all of those things. But um, you kind of see why, like they're super, well, actually the insole is pulling away from this. Hi, I can show you some guys some fun things inside. If my insole is coming off. Um, so the insole is a separate piece that's added later. Let's pop this wrong side out for a second. Um, so you can actually see these stitches on the inside. So, oh, that was one of the other questions that I got a lot. Where do you start? If you want to make historical shoes, other than starting with learning how to do modern ones, um, if you want to learn how to make turn shoes, this is, this is the better type. Start with Regency ones. Start with flat. Start with no heel. Um, cause, or medieval. Um, cause it's the same thing the whole way around. So you're learning that shoemaker stitch and how to deal with your all. Um, and... <laughs> That sort of thing but you can see this is where the stitch starts and then this is where the stitch ends um so you're going halfway through the leather so that way you don't actually see it on the outside and so there's nothing visible like you can see um on some of these down at the toes a little more visible like a little bit of a ladder there you go that's actually pretty good um you, so you can see where my stitches are as they go through the leather but not out of the leather um but this sort of thing and honestly, these are the, the antique lasts that you can find um, online on like eBay the most tend to be um, at that range. So like this is a antique one that I've based some of my stuff on. It's um, probably a Regency era, like early, early 19th century. Um, though it's a little bit weird. I'm still trying to figure it out because it's super well worn on the bottom and that's not typical for women's shoes. So they must have been doing like they must have been doing either channel shoes or something else with this, or maybe it is a men's last and they were doing welted um, shoes. It's not for women's turn shoes. You don't go through, you don't actually tack all the way through. It's one of the things that I learned pretty early on. So if you use the big tacks, like they're used to doing for men's shoes, you leave holes all around your shoe. Um, so like that, Let's see if I can find an example of that. I don't know if I can. Um, like I got most of them to close up on this, but like there's still some little tack holes. And then you can see I went way too shallow on all of my stitches. So I learned a lot in this, but there's like some little tack holes in some places along there. Um, and that I learned is not something that I ever saw in originals. So they don't actually go all the way through into the, the last. Um, so I switched that. So the fact that there's all of this wood eaten away on this last means that they were either doing channel shoes um, or welted shoes. So this might actually be a men's last. 
Um, but either way, the toe is starting to square just a little bit, so it's probably like 18, 14 range, 18, 15. Um, this is one of the ones that I made a repro of and then sent it off, and that's what um, my current lasts, my flatter lasts that I use, um, are done with. And sometimes you find vintage ones too, like this is a vintage one that I worked up to be the size and shape that I needed. Um, it had more leather on it originally, so I've actually worked most of that leather off. Most of it's not mine, it's somebody else's. Um, but it allowed me to reshape and reform. Um, cause that's like step one, get a last step two, make it actually fit you. Uh, so eh, that's the joyous part of that. Um, cause you use like your instep leathers, things like that. Um, sometimes they're built into the shoes, like the shoe lasts, um, so the le like wood part that pops out, but this is what allows you to fit it to your foot. But it's like that, that first step, that's one of the hardest is getting something to fit, getting it patterned right and all of that. Um, and that's something that is universal between whether it's modern or historic shoes. So you can learn that either way um, from the start and, and learn all of that. So what do I actually fill the tackles with? I try not to make tackles. <laughs> that's the key now. I try not to go through and make holes on the exterior. So the only big ones that I've got um, are down the... They're the ones that hold the, the actual sh like entire um, sole onto the last and you use a little stamp and it closes it up. Um, so it's actually one of the cool things about historic shoes. Some people have very unique stamps and you will start to see them repeated um, from say certain companies or shoemakers or places like that. Um, and so I've always been curious um, to like make an account of unusual ones. Um, and see if we could actually start tracking some things by that. So I picked one early on, and it's the same one that I've always used. It's a little bit like a starbursty sort of thing. Um, and that's how you close it up. You can sometimes put a little bit of beeswax in there um, and then close it up, which kind of helps seal it. But I generally don't, once it's sealed, I generally don't have issues, even if I've just stamped it, um, to get like water through that or anything. And it's just the outsole, so it doesn't really soak through the whole shoe that fast. Um, but yeah, that little little stamp thing. That's how you close up your big holes at the end. Um, or the ones in the heel, um, you're dealing with pegs. That's how you actually hold the heel um, stuff on as like a backup to the stitching. Little wooden pegs. And there's a fashion for doing shoes entirely with pegs. Like they had peg machines that just went around and did pegs around the hole outside of the shoe and that's how they attached the sole um, in the early 19th century. So if you ever find that, that is a distinct era. Like we got rid of that when we started doing cementing. Um, this because it was, you had to go in and cut off all the tops of the little wooden pegs because they have sharp points and they'll go all the way through and you got to cut that off. So they had specialty tools to go inside and, and cut those off. But there are plenty of stories of like them missing one or two and somebody putting on their shoes and having an incredibly painful experience um, being stabbed by a little wooden piece, <laughs> just jabbing at them. So yeah. Yep, yeah, you just re you just push the leather around. Um, it is a, um, for a black tea. <laughs> so. Which is very cold at this point, but, yeah. Yeah, oh cool, I'll have to look that up. Okay. Yeah, I'm super interested in that era, like, because it's mostly on men's shoes, so I haven't seen... And I've looked mostly at women's shoes. There aren't that many men's shoes in collections because they tend to get like worn out more because the style isn't as fashion heavy. Um, like they certainly do change in terms of shape and construction and things like that through the years. But like if you have a pair of black leather men's shoes, like it, it lasts a lot more than say like fashionable colors or fashionable uppers for women's shoes. Um, even though the toe shape does consistently change and like the overall shape of the shoe and other things like that, like where on the foot the lacing occurs or the buckle occurs changes. So there's definitely a lot of fashionable changes with men's shoes as well. Um, it's just not as jarring sometimes. Um, and they're not as distinct, I guess. So this is actually a great example. Um, this is one of my favorite pairs that I've made. Um, and this is... I can pinpoint this to 1816. So this is a great 
great example of like super fashionable, super distinct style. Um, it's based off of an original, which is at Colonial Williamsburg in their collections. And I can date it so well because the original actually has its little paper stamp um, up there. And we can um, specifically like the address that's on it. I went and looked up the company and they are only at that address um, between, I believe, 1813 and 1816 or something. Like they moved in 1816. So they would no longer have had that stamp. They would have had the new address on their stamp after 1816. However, this shoe has a square toe. And my argument that I've been finding from fashion plates and finding evidence of that way was that the square toe starts to come in in 1815, which is way earlier than most people supported. Um, in fact, this particular pair of shoes, I had a great argument with the long gone Janet Arnold, um, who had also looked at these shoes years ago and had declared them late 1820s. Um, and I went, no, I think they're earlier. And I went and looked up that label and lo and behold, has to be no later than 1816 because they moved. So if I can start pinpointing like 1815, you start seeing the square toes. That means this has got to be 1815, 1816. So like stuff like that where you're able to date it precisely but like this is such a distinct style like guaranteed this would not have continued on that might be why those shoes survived it's because like this is super trendy style like it's really cute but by the time you reach you know the 1820s it's it's different like it's the same i use the same last um but it's a very different style and shape and plainness and like there are certainly bows or rosettes that go on this but like where it how high it goes on the foot and all sorts of like this is so distinct this is a couple years of fashion um so if it didn't get bought and worn in those first couple years it's gonna be like all those crazy shaped heels right now like if you don't wear them out you're just you're gonna be like what was i thinking um later so uh, there's plenty of examples like that All right, what's some other fun things? I'll wrap up with the last few questions before I leave you all since it's been a little over an hour now. Um, probably go to about an hour and a half. So fashion loan that influences shoemakers today to make shoes that are so uncomfortable. Um, so I think the same reason that shoes today are so uncomfortable and problematic um, is the same reason that clothing has all sorts of bad fit issues or like we constantly talk about why do you not put in decent sized pockets? Um, it's because the having doing this job currently, um, you're really it's really hard to be that connected to your manufacturers. Like it it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and the people that get trained, there's there's no there's not a lot of training for this. Like I went through through a fashion design program for my master's, but I specifically did fashion history, but it was within the fashion department. Um, and they don't teach shoemaking there. Um, they don't teach shoe design. That That is its own special thing. So there are schools for that that will teach some classes on it, but it is not nearly as widespread. So people may end up getting into designing shoes, but have never actually done shoemaking. No different than there are plenty of people that design clothes that have never made clothes. And it usually is really obvious. We said that in theater all the time. There are plenty of costume designers who design beautiful things that we could never actually physically make. And you can tell the difference. Um, so I think there are a lot of people designing shoes that have never made shoes um, and don't actually spend time getting to know feet or how they need to work. And so there's just a disconnect there. And when things are normalized, um, you have to fight constantly to get things to be done differently. Um, and it's just because there's concepts of, oh, this is the way that we're doing it. It's like, yes, I get that, change it. Like, don't do it that way. And it is, it is a lot of effort to get manufacturers to completely change how they do things, do completely different techniques or shapes. Like they're just used to doing those same shapes and they're used to doing it for modern shoe shapes. <laughs> Stomach's growling. <laughs> um, so I think that's a big part of it is just there's because it, you're not seeing somebody make the shoes who then wears the shoes or gives them to a person or like sells them to a person that lives nearby and they will give them feedback on their shoes there's such a disconnect between the designer the manufacturer and the customer like there's so little feedback that occurs um and so little understanding because that's just not how the training works so 
Um, all right. What are some? Oh, geez, you guys suddenly asked a lot of questions while I was getting distracted on my little thing. Um, best brush. I shoe care. There are some people that do some wonderful shoe care videos. I am not an expert on that. Um, but I know there's there's some wonderful things out there. Um, I did not knit my sweater. It's from Cezanne, like most of my sweaters lately. <laughs> um, so wonderful French fashion company that does like very um, like you know eco-friendly stuff. Um, so that's one of the reasons I love them. Do, 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 do yeah, graphic designers designing clothes. Yes, one hundred percent. Yes, that. Um, so. Um, making clothes to go with costumes. A little bit of both. Um, I made these because I had to for my thesis, and then I made a gown to go with them. Um, my 18th century shoes are never made to match outfits because I have too many. <laughs> both, and I go through too many shoes, and I have too many outfits. Um, so I just usually try to pick things that go with them. But they didn't coordinate like we do with modern things. Like that's a very 19, like 30s, 40s, 50s concept of match your shoes to your purse and your gloves. And they didn't do that um, at all until then. So like I'm less concerned with matching and some things are just like universal. Um, you know, when you're talking about like, yes, I have a plain 1830s white silk satin slipper. This goes with all the things. Do I want to wear this outside in the rain? No, but it goes with all the things. <laughs> so like that's, that's the sort of thing that you, you know, occasionally I do make them to match. Like the, um, the 1920s shoes were made when I was designing the whole outfit, I did it all together. Um, but I generally will make shoes that I like and I will just try and pick colors that I like because then that's the colors I've already got in my closet. So a little bit of both. Other great shoe manufacturers. I honestly don't know. I have, I don't do a lot of historic shoe stuff outside of that. I make most of my own stuff and for modern, for very modern shoes, the brand that I tend to use most often is Everlane. I've had the best luck with them. Um, but again, same sort of thing. I really love their brand in general for all the things because they're super like straightforward and very clear about all of their products and where they come from and they're very good quality. Um, so I really like Everlane for modern, like modern, modern shoes. Um, but they still fall into all the weird heel stuff. I'm like why? So I usually just get their flats. Yeah, bone folder. Oh, yep. Bone. <laughs> um, that, that's used for rubbing and burnishing. Um, I also have burnishing sticks specific to different colors. Um, and then other weird tools that I have, like you gotta get a rasp and a file, but that's like your local hardware store. They got it. It's no different. It's exactly the same that it was for centuries. Um, where are my other burnishing sticks? Buried at the bottom of a very, like, very busy. <laughs> they're down there somewhere hey there's one i have an e antique ebony one um which has these weird little blips that are there for getting the sole corners um i have another antique dark leather one and i had to make one where is it um because when i'm doing light leather these will actually stain it and burnish it and darken it um so i had to make this one which is out of I'm not remembering the American word for it. Lime wood is the UK word for it. I can never remember the American word, but lime wood. So I made this out of lime wood, and that's what they recommend in the 18th century. Um, and I made this based off of shapes that are in, like, I think Garceau, um, The Art of the Shoemaker, which is a great book when you're learning how to do shoemaking in terms of you've already learned a little bit. It didn't make much sense to me until I actually learned shoemaking, and then I had to ignore some of what he said because he wasn't a shoemaker. He was just talking to them, and sometimes they communicated improperly or made stuff up. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, this is my little, like, what I use to smooth down white heels. Um, so when I'm doing, like, muay tall heels, um, this is what I'll use to actually smooth that down, because that's the hard part. Heels are the hardest part. That, like, eventually, guys, I'm gonna do, like, this year, hopefully, a video of making another pair of, of shoes with heel, and oh my god, I do not look forward to that. Like, that's the hardest part is getting because you stitch the heel cover on and then you put the heel in and then you stitch all the way around this and you have to like really work that down um that was the other problem that i had with my first pair of shoes i tried to use the silk on this like this is a silk um uh ribbed silk and i tried to use do that on the heel and 
I could probably do it now, but for a first pair of shoes, that was like the wrong choice. Like, <laughs> leather, leather is your friend. Um, if you're doing a first pair of shoes, don't go for like, I'm making fancy silk uppers. No, you will struggle. You won't keep them clean. You will be unhappy about it. You will pull things wrong. It's harder to fit. It's harder, like you'll rip it. You'll don't, don't be like me and do silk uppers for your first pair of shoes. Do like leather or wool. Like my second pair that I did, I did wool so much better. <laughs> it's like with clothing. Don't start with silk. Start with like wool or something. It's much, much friendlier. Basswood. That's the other term. Thank you. Um, yes. Oh, horses hoof picks. Oh, that was always one of the most satisfying things that I've found with horse riding. I don't know why. That was weird like that. Yeah, limewood, basswood. Yep. 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 Awesome. Thank you guys. Because <laughs> I use so many different types of wood depending on what thing. Like I said, um, rainbow poplar for heels. You can go lighter weight for your lasts, depending on how much you're going to use them, but you need something tough enough um, to actually not break or warp as you walk. But not so tough that you like want to murder yourself while you're carving it. Ask me how I know. Um, so yeah, and the hard part is you gotta make two of everything. So, same thing with the last, like, that's one of the reasons why, <laughs> like, what would be the easiest thing to start with? Regency, because they still have straight lasts. <laughs> so, like, and you don't have to worry about having two of everything. You can have one last and, like, it's good for both shoes. One last, no heels, stitched all the way around. Same thing with medieval, but medieval's right and left. You could probably do straight last and no one's going to care, um, being truly honest. But finding last that shape are really hard, so you're going to have to build that up. But you can still get like modern flat lasts that are pretty similar. You might just need to do a little bit of carving to get it better situated um, to having more of a like a narrow waist. So it flares. Usually in this one, like I said, I'm going to think this might be actually be like a men's last. Um, but usually you, you flare in a lot at the waist and then back out. Um, so that's some of those things that you'll need. Yeah, so, all right. Most recent shoes that I made. The ones I did a video on. Where'd they go? These, my, re my uh, really super pointy medieval shoes, um, which are super comfortable. And like, I can't wait for the weather to warm up so I can just like wear them. Like all the time. <laughs> Like, I'm going to make more than one. I need to make other colors. Um, so. But other than that, I think prior to that, it would be these. Because I finished these um, right when I moved. So. Yeah. No, they should have a very, very curvy. Like, I mean, these are, like I said, I made these off the originals, which is a great example of, like, 1860s. Um, and it's slightly curved. It's hard to see in this, but it's actually got a lot of curve that way um but yeah very narrow waist in comparison to the front because you don't they are not usually supporting the underneath your foot there and it makes the shoe look really dainty and tiny um in a place where it's not concerned like it's still big enough to go around your foot but you don't need big wide support in that area very little of your foot actually touches the the shoe there so <laughs> um but yeah so to reiterate some of the stuff that I said at the beginning, I recommend going and checking out Marcel Marsan, um, M-R-S-S- M-R-S-A-N. Um, and I know there's some other shoemaking, like, teaching things, but yeah, that, he, he's been doing it for a long time, and he's very knowledgeable, um, and he's done some great, I, I took one of his online courses on making modern women's shoes, um, because I was curious what the differences were. Turns out not that many. Because uh, when I was doing my, my 1920s ones, um, I was like, how do you work with modern, like, modern things? I also actually made a modern pair of shoes. Maybe it was that. That was the point that I did it. I made a single modern shoe for an experimental class. Um, and so I was using, like, modern shanks, which are the support that goes inside to support here because the heel doesn't extend underneath the foot like it does in 18th century. So you need something to support your arch. Um, and so that was one of those things that I did. 
um, was learn how to deal with that. In the early 20th century, they used layered cardboard, which is what I did inside of this one, which is super cool. So it's nice and stiff and doesn't doesn't bend and flex very much. Like this is a very stiff shoe comparison to um, a lot of my others, which are, even though they're heels, they're, you know, like this is lightweight comparison. So it can still flex and move a lot more. It doesn't have any sort of shank in it, weirdly enough. Like I couldn't see any evidence of it in the original, but the, the leather seemed to do that. So, um, well, all these things are really comfortable, even on gravel. Um, it just means that you're, you're able to move and flex more, but without like having any pinpoint things sticking through your foot. Like I'm not good at barefoot. My feet are, my feet are really picky and fragile. So, yep. Um, heels are hard to carve. Heels are hard to attach for 18th century. They're easier when you get into 19th century and they're knock on heels. Um, you know, like when you're, this isn't stitched on, this is, I made the heel, I covered, like, took the heel that was the right shape, I covered it, and you glue it on and you nail it down, like you nail or screw through the top um, into it so it's nice and sturdy. But um, in the 19th century when heels come back and they're doing that knock on heel style, like this one's a stacked knock on heel, um, so it's stacked leather and then it, that are pegged together and then I shape it and curve it out and then I attach it. Um, they constantly talk about how this is like a skill and an art and like getting a good heel maker makes or breaks your shoe and like how skilled that particular trade is people that carve and make heels or make the wooden stacked ones like this like that is the gods of shoemaking it like shoemakers keep writing about like how hard it is to find somebody that's good at that and how hard that particular part of the trade is so which i i fully agree with um that's that is my least i'm not gonna say my least favorite that is the most challenging part and it's so exciting and satisfying when you make the first one and it looks beautiful and then you remember you have to make a second one and then you want to set everything on fire so because like, now you have to do it again but you have to do it again the same so like like why do we have like it just same thing with like i set that sleeve perfectly i have a left arm oh no so yeah. But yes, I find these to be really comfortable. I wore them for years. Um, like I, said, I worked at Colonial Williamsburg from 2007 to 2015, doing lots of different odd jobs. Um, I did a lot of evening programs where I walked around in tours and wore them all the time then. I did lots of like standing and walking around in trade shops when I did the daytime jobs as well. And I just I was in those shoes all the time. So I found them incredibly comfortable and I could have worn modern versions, um, but I tried that a few times and didn't like it as much. And it wore my feet out more because um, the feet fought back, not the feet, the shoes fought back against my feet. Um, and it just made it far less stable and uncomfortable. And yeah, so where am I with a coat? I'm getting there. Um, I might get to the point where I can put sleeves on today, maybe. It's not lining. I'm hoping to do lining tomorrow. So it'll be done. I was going, to, and I should specify, I was going to do a video this week, uh, but then I realized I kind of wanted to spend Christmas with my friends and family. <laughs> I was like, no, we're going to do a live. So you guys get an extra long, um, very uh, random live talking about shoes um, today, rather than me talking about arsenic, which was my original plan, um, which will be a later video. So hopefully I get this coat done this week. And get that video up and going and then we can talk about arsenic later because it's so interesting there's so much um did you know arsenic was in like everything not just green <laughs> like that was like oh no oh no um but yeah see so i don't know do you guys have any other specific questions about shoes or my background. I'm cool with talking about that too. Um, if not, I'll wrap stuff up here because we've now made it over an hour and a half and I definitely don't want to go over two hours. So um, unless there's any other questions and I'll do more videos on shoemaking and all that stuff later um, over the next however long. I we'll just keep doing this. Um, so There'll definitely be a lot more shoemaking videos coming your way, but 
Like, I don't know. There's, it's, there's so much to talk about. That's the great part about it. Um, it's such a weird, unknown area for most people. And, like, there are some other wonderful people, um, like... Vicky that that do shoemaking and there's a variety of people that do historical shoemaking like Sean Picard and like just there's some wonderful wonderful shoemakers out there um but but yeah there it's a limited quantity of us um what you see on the internet is pretty much what there is that's the cool part um but yeah shoes I mean I wish I could show you all the ones behind me there's so many like Oh, I think someone did ask how many shoes have I made. Give me one second. I actually have a list of this. I need to add one more pair to it now that I've done it. Um, where are they? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. I've now made twenty-eight pairs of shoes. Um, that I can remember because <laughs> part of it's I've made shoes for other people and of course I don't see them anymore so I don't it's harder for me to remember because I've made some shoes for my friends over the years um I made some shoes do I have okay I do have her on the list I made some shoes for some customers um some of which don't even realize they have shoes made by me because I did them under my um teacher's name um where he was busy with lots of things and I was picking up women's shoes and so I was handed partially um started shoes to finish so i've made shoes for people that i don't think realize i made shoes for them which is pretty cool which is very like historically accurate like your apprentice making shoes for the for the company um so okay last few things um make oh old shoes were triangular um it's just all deceptive i really want to get into like some 1850s crazy curvy shit so like it's just gonna be like oh, crazy stuff. Like just those are so curvy and weird. Um, do, 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 do UK versus US? They really don't differ historically. Um, I've never really seen them be terribly. Di there's a there's a discussion in the mid 19th century that UK shoes are clunkier and more healthy than American shoes, but I think that's like all of the same styles were available it's just what women chose to wear was because they're more like farm women rather than like women were just like no it's cold it's damp i'm wearing these shoes i'm tired of being cold and damp and and when you went to the america you went to suddenly all these like people didn't necessarily travel to the countryside as much i don't think and so they saw these women in the city wearing these dainty little shoes that like they got sick and they didn't actually get sick from their shoes but they said that um so i don't know i don't i don't i haven't seen terrible differences um, between them. How do you deal with white feet? Stretch your shoes. Get a, sh get a good shoe stretcher, get some shoe stretch, shoe stretch spray. Find shoes that do not have stitching or other weird things across the joint of the foot or wherever you need to stretch it. Just make sure you go with things that are like, like, this is a great shoe for stretching. Very easy to stretch. There's nothing interrupting that. Um, this is not a great shoe for stretching. We have piping and binding and things that will not stretch and lots of stitching that will not stretch. Don't do this. Um, and learn to love your shoe stretcher. So, yeah, we'll definitely do more <sighs> shoe college. We'll definitely do um, more like shoe videos, and I'll, I'll do a walkthrough of all of that at some point. So, let's see what else? Oh, videos on fitting menswear to female bodies. So many planned. That's the other thing that's in a pile over there. <laughs> I'm doing, oh, since you guys are here, I'm doing, um, the next thing I'm doing in terms of that topic is I'm doing 19, a 1920 suit. Um, and I'm very specifically aiming it towards talking about fitting menswear to less than ideal men's bodies. Because not all men have ideal bodies. And sometimes women like to wear menswear and non-binary and dealing with whatever your body does. Nobody has, like... We have the same problem in women's wear. Why, why should it not be like that in men's wear that like your body is not ideal for that era or that shape? No, you're fine. We'll, we'll work, we're going to work through it. We're going to we're going to talk about it and I'm going to show you how to fix it. Um, so, yes. Where have I gotten my antique shoemaking tools? eBay. Lots and lots of eBay and some gifting um, from people. Um, some are reproduction. Like these things are reproduction all halves from um, different. I should ask who did this. It's been a while. Like it's been a long time since I've had those made um 
But yes, walk through the shoes, haha. Um, as you lose weight, you don't tend to lose too much mass. Like, you don't gain mass in your feet. You might unstretch your feet. Um, so the width thing is based off of... It's kind of like your fingers. If you if you do this with your hands a bunch, they will start to stretch out, and you will actually be able to do that further. <laughs> so that's essentially what you're doing to your feet. And it's only done because you're putting pressure on it all the time, so it forces everything to stretch. Um, I actually lost width in my feet at one point. Um, but... Um, there are all sorts of shoe cushions. Um, the biggest problem when you lose width in your feet is that you're going to slide forward into your shoes. Um, toe spacers. And other inserts. Like, always inserts and uh, adjust your shoes. No different than, like, shoe, like your clothes will never fit you perfectly unless they're oversized and baggy or whatever. They're never going to fit you tightly. You have to custom fit those. That's why rich people look really good in their jeans. They have them custom fit. Same thing with your shoes. Stretch them, pad them, all of those things. Um, so, Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Do I have a P.O. box? No. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> um, I'll look into that at some point in the near future, but I only just, I actually just made 20,000 subs yesterday, guys. So that was like, thank you. I was so excited about that. Um, but yeah. No, I, I would love to shadow somebody and learn more about feet at some point. It's on my list eventually. I've learned a lot, like I said, just from working with people, making shoes for other people. They're very, when when you're making shoes or fitting shoes to other people, they're very open talking about their feet. There's not a stigma about feet like there is about bodies. Um, so people I have found are incredibly oversharing with their feet. <laughs> and so I have, I've learned a lot just from talking to people um, and thinking of shoes the same way that I think of fitting clothes. Um, and so, like, it weirdly is useful. Um, cool binder vest. Neat. I'm so, like, I'm so, yeah. Yes, loss of collagen, age, and all those things. Gosh, yeah. Feet are so... Feet are weird. That's always been my thing. Feet are weird. Feet are like cats. They're meaning that, like, that was always my thing. Like, will these fit me? I don't know. Feet are like cats. They fit into weird spaces. They're not supposed to be able to fit into. Do they look comfortable? No. But somehow it works? I don't know. Like, they're, they're not. They're solid objects, theoretically. But they're not. <laughs> they're really not. <laughs> Feet are so weird. Okay, guys. Well, we're coming up. We're just about two hours. Um. So. Oh, um they cannot be shrunk shoes cannot be shrunk um once it's 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 like stretching out your body your skin it's it even living skin it's hard for it to come back um so yeah it's but you can pad out the inside so you just can't actually make the shoes smaller um do i have a favorite era i really God, i have so many i love edwardian kirby stuff i really love the crazy 1850s kirby shoes but i don't really love anything else about the 1850s um <laughs> So, like, I should, yeah, I can draw shoes with cats coming out of them. That'd be funny. Um, so, but I really love, like, that. the reason why I made that 1920 shoe is just that. That is, like, oh, pinnacle design for crazy stuff going on then. Um, so, yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, massage. I didn't even think about the fact that you'd have to think about feet and massage therapy. Like, that's, that is a very specific thing, so... Yep. Okay. Awesome, guys. So thank you so much for hanging out. This will um, go live after I'm done with it. It'll go up. So if you missed the beginning or anything like that, it will be there later um, as my video for the week. So thank you, guys. Feel free to keep asking questions. I'll try and keep track of comments and answer some questions that people might have in the future. So if you're watching this later, don't worry. I will still love to answer questions for you guys. Um, as best as I can. Some things may be too complicated and may just end up in later videos um, with all of that. But yeah, thanks for hanging out. It was great to chat with you guys um, and have wonderful holiday season.